Bonjourno, and welcome to the Author's Preface, the show that explores how authors are forged. I'm your host, Sam Hale, and thanks for checking out the pod. So what's good with me? Not a whole lot. Wanted to do a quick shout out. A lot of cool places checking out the pod. That's always really encouraging. Obviously, the United States, a lot of great people here mentioned some in a previous pod, but I totally neglected to mention my home state of Alaska. A lot of people listening there really appreciate it. And I actually had fellow Alaskan Robert Stark on a few pods ago, and he wrote an excellent exploration of his own experiences at war and back on the home front returning from Iraq called Warflower, which I strongly recommend. But we also have people across the UK, Scotland, Ireland, Singapore, France, Canada, Belgium, Australia, Indonesia, Germany. But wait, there's more. Denmark, China, Sweden, the United Arab Emirates, Slovakia, India, Spain, Mexico, Finland, Bulgaria. <laughs> List goes on. Really humbling. Really appreciated if you're listening and you're in one of those places. Why not hit me up on Twitter? at Sam Hale. Yeah. Let me know what you think of the show. If you're enjoying it, if you have any recommendations for authors you'd like to hear, or if you are an author yourself, hit me up. We can get you on the show. And if you are enjoying the show, rate and review, it's always appreciated. This is a continuation of a previous podcast with author and educator Jacobo de la Quercia. Really enjoyed that first pod discussing the monomyth and using Star Wars as a bit of a case study and analyzing the monomyth, the hero's journey. But who is Jacopo? In case you missed it, historical fiction, comedy, satire, and academic fiction author, known for publications such as The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy, License to Quill, and McTrump. He has been awarded various grants with the Humanities New York, the New York State branch of the National Endowments for the Humanities, and he's been featured in numerous publications such as CNN Money, The Huffington Post, Politico Magazine, as well as BBC America. Jacopo has degrees in history and political science. He enjoys video games, good man, board games, film, reading, and taking long walks. I think that's just a prereq for writers. If you'd like to find out more about Jacopo, you can go to his website, jacopodelacuercia.com. Also on Twitter and has a lot of fun amusing tweets, insightful ones, political as well. Just really interesting stuff. And that's at Jacopo underscore Dela underscore Q. And now I get to do something I have been waiting years to do. I'm a historical fiction writer, among other things, obviously, and a lover of podcasts. So surprise, surprise, my favorite podcaster is Dan Carlin of Hardcore History. He actually, with his Punic Nightmares series, inspired me to write the novel I'm working on, which depicts a scrappy band of survivors after the fall of Carthage in 146 BCE, after the third and final Punic War between the republics of Carthage, which is based in modern-day Tunisia, North Africa, the Maghreb, and Rome, who you may have heard of. But Dan's had an immense influence on my views, not only of history, but on how to interpret it. And so as a bit of an homage, I thought I might emulate him whenever he's doing one of his series and you get to part two or three or four, and it goes a little something like this. What you're about to hear is part two in a two-part series. If you're a bit of a masochist and you feel like just skipping the first part, by all means. But if you'd like a little bit more context, understand who it is we're talking about today, then check out part one of this two-part preface on author and educator Jacobo de la Quercia. Thanks, Dan. So, Jacopo, we've had an awesome discussion, more or less a master class on how to execute the monomyth and how not to as well. I want to get back to you here and look at doubts. Were there any doubts, obstacles, anything that was keeping you from taking writing, whether it was fiction or some of your more academic work? Was there any sort of roadblock? keeping you from taking it seriously? Well, one thing that definitely got in the way with my higher education is um, I was accepted into um, the Graduate Center at um, CUNY, New York. I'm sorry, at um, yeah, the Graduate Center at CUNY, New York in Manhattan, where I was going to be taking an exhaustive program on Latin as part of a prerequisite for master's and PhD studies in history. That um, need to understand several languages, Latin being a very big one for medieval and Renaissance history. 
Well, in 2008, literally the day before I was supposed to go to Manhattan for my, um, my first classes, I was hired by the Obama campaign. I, I need to clarify that. I was brought in as um, basically an internship for the Obama campaign that led to me working full time for them. So um, I spoke to the people at the school. They're actually very, very supportive. They said, um, go, hope your guy wins. So I did that. Then one year later, I reapplied for the same program. And this time I was given a scholarship to study with them. And that time I did go. However, it was the summer of 2009. It was during the uh, very beginning of the swine flu pandemic. And I was one of the first people that my doctor in Pennsylvania knew of who got swine flu twice. Hmm. It was the middle of the summer, 100 degrees out. I am in a large assembly wearing layers, sweatpants underneath my jeans, wearing several t-shirts and a thick sweater on top of it and a leather jacket on top of that, sweating bullets, and I was freezing. And so I had swine flu really bad. It was the first week of class. Like that scenario I just described, that was our orientation day. Oh. And I, they said, are there any questions? And I raised my hand. I was like, what do we do if we're sick? And they're like, you have to come to class. I'm like, what if we're really sick? Because we were basically learning an entire credited semester of Latin a week for an entire summer. It was basically, an, it was basically like a, a BA in Latin in one summer. Hmm. So uh, I, was, I tried doing that for uh, a week. And I think by day four, I knew I couldn't go any further. So I went home with that. I returned the scholarship. And I'm sorry to say that was the furthest I've ever gone in my graduate degree. That was one thing that definitely changed the trajectory of my life and um, my creative endeavors. I do want to say, though, that um, the professors were wholly understanding once they realized what the situation was like. I actually remained in close contact with the director of that school when he came to some of the Latin that I used in uh, both of my books or both of my novels. I mean, that was one thing where that was the first time where I had to make a, a serious call when it came to my health, when it came to anything that I was doing. The truth is that that summer was a, it was not a wake up call. It was rather the first of several real body blows that my body was going to be taking when it came to health. Like the first challenge with the first book is, will I finish the book? Cause I'd never written a book before. I, I was very confident in material. And um, I had received, I had crossed enough thresholds that I knew that I had a good book here. I just needed to actually finish it. So that was tough. But once I did that, I was now an author with a book on the way. So I knew that I was capable of writing books. When it came to License to Quill, though, I was writing that during a period where um, I was a full-time writer at that point. And I learned the hard way that staying up really late at night, the food that I was eating with very bad diet. Um, I was never doing any substance abuse or anything like that, thankfully. But I basically learned the hard way that a writer also needs to be their own physical trainer. I mean, I would spend an entire days, plural, in a chair writing. No walking, no, not, no natural sunlight, no exercise. I would put off meals for hours and hours. And uh, it sent me in a very bad place health-wise in the sense that uh, I and uh, many people around me did not think I was going to be lasting that long. Fortunately, I was able to do two things. Uh, one, I was able to take the advice that I needed to hear in order to get rid of the bad prescriptions I was being given and focus on the good prescriptions I was given. Mm -hmm. And I was able to um, get out of uh, it. looks like the one thing that was really bothering me was acid reflux yeah. in particular. Because with acid reflux comes sleeplessness, comes panic, anxiety, all these other things. So anyways, once that was under control, I was able to nail the book. Fortunately, my publishers gave me a three-month extension to work on it. And I put a lot of the physical toiling I was going through into Shakespeare when he gets the plague and license to mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, just you know, a lot of the lousy winters in my books... Uh, that's upstate New York. That's me living in Albany at the time, pissed off with all the shoveling I had to do. Uh, when it comes to all the sleeplessness in my books, that's me actually staying up really late, working on the book, putting it in there. And when it comes to Shakespeare near death, when it comes to Marlowe living like a slob, 
I don't like being autobiographical. It's just at that moment in my life, that was the best material I was able to add to the book. You write what you know. Yep. Because the truth is, I really mean this. I'm really not interested in myself. I mean, these historical figures are the ones that are the real fascinating draw in these books. But one thing I have learned is how human many of them are. And that once you actually see the human element of some of them, once you shatter that marble statue of them a little bit, you actually are able to put them in scenarios that otherwise may be unpleasant. Or how do I put this? It reminds me of um, how I heard Alfred Hitchcock directed Cary Grant in the movie North by Northwest. Awesome movie. Highly recommend it to anybody. It's the reason why we have James Bond films. It's Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest. Anyways, in that movie, the famous scene that even if you haven't seen the movie, you probably know the scene of Cary Grant running away from a biplane that's chasing him in a cornfield. Mm -hmm. That uh, the AFI, the American Film Institute, back in 1999, I think it was, they did an analysis, like a television, no, it was 2000, no, 2001. They did an analysis of like uh, the greatest American thrillers. North by Northwest was number four on the list. And they were talking, the one critic that was talking about that film said is he felt like Hitchcock wanted to torment Cary Grant, getting this incredibly handsome guy, having an airplane chasing him, ruining his suit, dropping dust on him. Like you can't do that to anyone. You can't do that to Jesus Christ. You become blasphemous. You can't do that to some other people. They'll call you a traitor or dishonorable. But if you're able to humanize them before you do that, then you can actually get these historical figures and you're able to make audiences realize that the part of them that we lionize is really just this one fingernail in their otherwise gross, sweaty, foul-smelling body. <laughs> I love that. I was looking at your preface within the doubt section. One thing that makes me laugh now because it's antithetical to what I know about you, which is you said you knew absolutely nothing about the demands placed on writers nowadays, such as promotion and PR. And for folks who haven't checked you out on Twitter, I don't know if you take this as an insult, but you are prolific. I mean, you're incredibly active on Twitter, and I think in a healthy way, in a really interesting and fun way. I really enjoy looking at your tweets. How long did that take? Was that kind of like pulling teeth? Or was that something that pretty early on, despite these doubts, you turned out to enjoy? No, what happened was uh, my publishers, they sent me um, a little bit like the profile you sent me. They sent me like a 20-page document that I had to fill out. Every aspect that of myself that could be useful for promotion for book sales. And so one of them was like, what social media are you on? And the truth is, I really didn't like using social media. I thought it was distracting. I at the time, I thought it was kind of toxic. But with all that said, they said, um, you can't stay off of social media. You need to have a visible presence somewhere. So I looked at several options there. And the truth is, I would have loved it if I created a YouTube channel. But I just, I just didn't understand video editing. It was before there were a lot of tutorials on YouTube. So I wasn't able to learn on the fly. So um, I put together a Twitter account and... Um, over the course of two years, I was able to figure out how to translate the following I had from the online comedy writing that I was doing, the comedy website crack.com. A lot of them didn't know I was on Twitter. So I was able to find a way to funnel that in there. But at the same time, I was able to find many things that I liked about Twitter. Like I really liked the writing community that they had. I really liked um, putting out sort of writing assignments for people. I would put an image, add a caption to this. You're writing a novel where the chapter is this, what happens next. I would also put together these very detailed scenarios, which I had the hashtag pop quiz hotshot, where I would ask writers to basically write what happens next in the scene using this premise. And uh, those were things that I really did enjoy. And I actually made some friendships on Twitter. Um, I helped some other writers, had some collaborations. A few times I was, I was able to help some people in need. And uh, there were other times people were able to help me at that moment. So all that together, I was able to use Twitter as um, my primary uh, social media uh, mouthpiece when it came to books that were coming out. Um, I will be honest, um, uh, the way that Twitter is right now, I'm basically spinning a coin on the table every day over whether I deactivate my account right now. Mm -hmm. I know that NPR recently quit Twitter permanently. And I do want to say, though, that uh, there's many writers 
uh, aspiring and published that are really that actually are suffering right now when it comes to uh, the current trajectory that Twitter is taking, uh, primarily non-white authors, uh, many people in many of the subgroups on Twitter, where they've created fantastic communities for sharing books, sharing writing material, building friendships, etc. And so many of them have disappeared as quickly as the blue check marks by their name. So I don't know where Twitter is going to be going right now, but if anyone is listening, my advice for anyone, go on TikTok. Like that's where, if I were starting right now, if I was given that cute, if I was given that questionnaire and if I was told, um, you don't have anything you need to create something, I would probably start on TikTok. Testing the waters, Jacopo, what kinds of baby steps did you take toward writing your first novel? You've got this academic experience in your back pocket. How much did that translate over? Like you mentioned, you felt pretty confident. Was there really any testing of the waters or did you just run headfirst at this thing? Well, I mean, naturally, I didn't write the, uh, when it came to my first novel, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy, I didn't write the whole book and then like, send it to a publisher and say, I want to be a writer. <laughs> no, I had several ideas for my first novel. And that was actually not the one at the time I was really pushing. But uh, my agent at the time, wonderful woman, um, Sarah Crow, she was able to explain to me that um, this type of book would be very desirable right now. She was explaining to me the benefits that it would offer in terms of marketing and uh, advances, etc., And also opportunities to publish would be best if I were to be writing this book well, I think the term she used was it was an evergreen subject when it came to Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Evergreen is an industry term where something is always going to have an audience. There's always going to be books on Abraham Lincoln. They're always going to sell. There's always going to be a need to study him. So when it came to that, I actually wrote, I think it was three or four chapters. I wrote the first chapter with the help of a friend of mine who's a, a mixed martial artist where we studied karate together and we basically choreographed a scene together that I was scripting, which would become chapter one of the Pocket Watch Conspiracy. And after I had that, I wrote um, the next two chapters, I think over the course of one day, which I actually now know uh, as a writer is actually a lot to create. So I had about 20 or 30 pages of this that um, I was sending to my agent at the time who I had already had interviews with, already spoken to her on the phone, already sent her like, you know, like one to two page synopses of book ideas that I could write. Each one of them somehow involved in getting a whole lot of history and trying to make it more interesting and approachable. And so with that, she had those three to four chapters and uh, she shopped them to several publishers. And one of them eventually at um, an editor at um, St. Martin's Press picked it up. And so for that, um, they just, I think they had a few questions and then they signed me on. So they gave me an advance. I used the advance to write the entire book over the course of about, I think it was over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. And when I handed it in, I, I know originally I was asked if I could write the book in six months. And I said, I want to, I want a whole year to work on this. The reason being is I said, this is going to be a, a unique type of book. It's going to require a whole lot of research and a material that I really didn't know much about. I deliberately chose Taft because I thought most people wouldn't know about him because I was a student of history and I didn't know anything about him. So I spent about half a year reading every single book I could find the best books on him and on his world. I uh, watched all these YouTube documentaries. I created like these detailed folders in my browser folders with all these different hyperlinks going to all these different um, aspects of research. And I kept a handwritten journal where I would have almost synopses of important passages from books and then the number from that book. So I was able to basically memorize a lot of what I needed from books by reading this, like this very small diary entry that I had, where it would have synopses of these other chapters to the point that just by reading the diary, I was able to remember the whole pages and paragraphs associated with it. So after about six months, went back to the manuscript, which I had put down for half a year, and I eventually finished the manuscript at a rate, I think the healthy rate I was working at was 250 words a day. And then eventually, um, once I was falling behind with that, it was up to about a thousand words a day. 
And then on one very chaotic evening, I think I wrote over, I think I wrote over 8,000 words a day. Ooh, that's a good run. Craziest one, I want to say, for License to Quill, uh, roughly the last, I think the last uh, six chapters of that book were written in one day. Wow. Keep in mind, it was pretty rough when I finished it. It wasn't as, uh, wasn't polished. And like, and like even the book today, like uh, License to Quill, if you have the first edition of it, it, it has lots of typos in it. Mm. Well, a lot of, a lot of uh, errors nowadays, the approach is just get the book out there. We'll clean them up immediately for the online version. And then if there's an updated version, we'll, we'll clean them up. That manuscript, I mean, like I said, when I wrote all that in one day, it was covered with blood and sweat and pustules and hair. It was, it was pretty bad. And bubos. Yes. <laughs> uh, real quick, because I want to get to something to do with research, but apocryphal or true, Taft's bathtub, was it really that large or did it need to be, was it just a normal size one? Oh, it really was that large. What's not true is that he got stuck in it. Mm. Taft was very aware of his, his girth. And it was one thing that he was very intelligent in that when he would stay at someone's house, for example, um, uh, Robert Todd Lincoln's house in uh, Vermont, for example, Hildeen, he requested the mattress to be on the ground. That's clearly a man who is intelligent when it comes to not accidentally knocking out all four posts of a four post. <laughs> when it comes to the bathtub, Taft, the story with Taft getting stuck in the bathtub, that did not exist until after Taft was out of the White House. Now, the problem is it has a very detailed paper trail. I have an excellent book from Oxford University Press where they say that actually happened. And they have sources backing that up, good sources. Problem is, it's not true. Hmm. It wasn't until, uh, I think, the last 15 years someone actually did the investigation found that Taft never did get stuck in the bathtub. But it is true. The bathtub was large enough for four people. Getting to research, you and I both write historical fiction and... One of the things I've talked about with authors such as Karen Oden, who writes like historical thrillers, good stuff, is info dumping. Is it okay to just have mass exposition in a story or do you prefer to breadcrumb? What are your thoughts on info dumps when it comes to delivering large amounts of history in a fictitious novel? I mean, there's times where you have to do it, but there's also times where it's an appropriate moment. It's a break in conversation where you might actually show what's going on through their minds. I mean, in uh, License to Quill, for example, I mean, I give about like 70 years worth of British history summarized when it comes to the Office of Ordnance. The reason why I'm doing that is because I am creating what for some people's reading might be the beginnings of James Bond and MI6. Like what it actually is, is this is the beginning of British intelligence. It's a fascinating history on its own. So I explain where the building is. I explain who was the king that was behind it. What role is it playing? I'm using the actual history to create the understanding of why Shakespeare is called a double O agent. It's a kind of thing where one, it's separating it from the double O agents legally. But the truth is, this is the most realistic place where it would be happening. If you were going to be a secret agent, you would be working there. If you were going to be getting the best technology that could create the best gadgets and weapons, you would be getting it here. So I'm establishing both the world and the environment and the location and also the title of these people in a way that is explained in narration as Shakespeare is simply walking towards the building in addition to capturing the look of it, the smell of it, how odd it is that there's so many ravens uh, flying over there, etc. So we kind of touched on one of your setbacks being a pretty intense, two intense bouts of the flu, but what other sorts of setbacks did you encounter as you started to take the deep dive into writing fiction? Well, another big challenge uh, once you write a book this is no guarantee that anyone's going to know that it exists. I mean, every book that you write, every book out there is competing with every other book out there. I mean, it's competing with every film that came out that weekend, every commercial that, you know, billions of dollars are being invested in so that people will stop what they're doing and get that soft drink or eat that fast food burger. When it comes to like getting a person's interest, any book that you write is competing with all the pornography on the internet. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a hell of a distraction. So um, 
I, I learned the hard way that when it comes to actually getting like major mainstream reviews and all those names, all those positive reviews and all those stars that you have on the inside of a book or on its jacket, that uh, it's very difficult to even get a good or a bad review because there's so many books out there and it's getting larger each time. And if people don't review your book, it's like it doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, then what did you just spend your last year investing in? And another thing is, um, it's a little discouraging once you realize that if you're creating, uh, if you are writing, that you have to keep on doing this, whether you like it or not. I'm much more interested in writing books because I'm going to tell the story rather than because I'm trying to add fuel to a fire. I think that is, and I've talked with a number of authors, whether it's trad published, Andy yourself, and within the self-published realm in particular, whether or not the people I've spoken with have any kind of resentment toward it, they absolutely acknowledge the fact that you need to be producing at a rate that tends to be higher frequency than if you're traditionally published. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I hadn't really thought about that. Have you spoken with authors in various realms, trad self or anything like that, who find that the impetus to continue writing actually hampers creativity? Well, every writer that I've spoken to that's like, you know, been a New York Times bestseller or every writer that I consider a very successful writer, uh, they are aware that like, I mean, this is a career. And so they know that guess what, if this is your career, you're going to have to continue to write books. You can't just, you know, write to kill a mockingbird and then just, you know, piggyback off that success for the rest of your life. It's an incredibly rare occurrence. I've never spoken to a writer who believes that they wrote a bad book. And even if they did, I don't know if they would even tell me that. Because the truth is, uh, there's a difference between the book that you write and the book that's printed. And a lot of people that you work with, even if you have a bad experience with them, uh, this uh, one New York Times bestselling author told me this, that um, the truth is you may be working with some people in the future, even if you didn't have a good experience with them in the past. So for that reason, if something didn't work out or if you feel that... Um, there was a need to really create that the urgency uh, interfered with creativity that it's probably best for you to keep that to yourself and use that for motivation for your next work to be better i mean i'm lucky in the sense that you know because i am a teacher because i, I live in a, a very beautiful and very inexpensive part of the world upstate new york this place is heaven if you work remotely for anybody um, I was in a position where I could focus a lot more on the quality of the work I was doing. Something else, though, is I was very experimental. I, uh, I wrote short stories that were horror just because I wanted to see what it would be like. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I had already had a sequel planned for the pocket watch conspiracy that I eventually realized, wait a minute, after I wrote, after I wrote License to Quill, I was thinking there's a lot more that I could be working with here. And uh, there were some shorter works I was doing, some academic things that I was very interested in, and uh, some other stuff that I'm working on right now that I'm very interested in that took me in different directions. Ultimately, though, a book should be finished when it's done. It should not be rushed. If you cook something prematurely, it's not going to be a cake. It's not going to be pizza. It's going to be a puddle of goo. And it is possible to rescue something like that, but... I'm much more interested in creating something with the best quality that I can with my abilities than doing something just for the sake of doing it. I mean, I'm willing to experiment if someone invites me, if um, there's a good cl collaboration, for example, if it's a crazy challenge that I can make or if that I can meet. My uh, third book, Mac Trump, my co-writer and I, we were asked to write that entire book in five weeks. Wow. We did it. And we did the whole thing remotely. And this was before the lockdowns, hmm. back when people were never working remotely when it came to writing a whole book. So that was very unique for me. Like we were the first people we had ever heard of that wrote a book on Google Docs without ever even met, without having even met each other. So that was um, when it came to that, that was a challenge. But at the same time, I was working with an incredibly gifted writer, Ian. Ian, if you're listening to this, you will always be my senior and my writer. But um, we had a big challenge. We were able to meet it. And um, the, the important thing is we were working with people that were flexible in the sense that they understood what they were delivering and when they were delivering it. 
and if we requested a little bit more time, they were able to offer it to us. So I want to do something a little different here and actually combine Going Pro with the New World because I want to be mindful of your time and actually look at the synthesis there from the moment or if it was organic, realizing you're a pro at this writing thing and how that blended into this new world prior to when you first started out. Well, there was a moment where Jonathan Mayberry, very dear friend of mine, uh, the man who introduced me to uh, my first agent and the man who, after I met him, I was writing books. There was a moment after I had just come back from, I think my second book signing of the day for my first novel, The Pocket Watch Conspiracy. I was in an elevator going up in Albany and I received a call from him. I said, how does it feel to be a published author? And I never thought about that before. It was something that I now had for the rest of my life. And it offered me a little bit of a confirmation with my abilities that my own doubt would not allow. So at that point, I couldn't change the fact I was now a published author, an entire novel to my credit. So at that point, I knew that I, I had an experience that I could share with people to help them have their first works published. I also had an understanding of the industry, most recent understanding of the industry that I could share with people. Um, I also knew that um, I had a working relationship with a major publisher, St. Martin's Press, that I was happy to continue based on my positive experiences with them. So all of that made me understand that I was still in the same world that I started in. It's just, I now knew more about it and how it functioned. There's a line I use every now and then in um, my books. I think it's, I know it's in License to Quill. And I feel like it's in The Pocket Watch Conspiracy where I was like, I see something about how like that's how the world works or that's not how the world works. Those are things that, that was a mindset that I had when it came to my time working a political campaign where I was learning for the first time how this country I had always lived in worked, whether I liked it or not, this was its functioning. This is what it did and how it did it. And I just now understood that aspect of publishing after my first novel in the sense that while the industry has changed, the idea, the change, like, you know, the departure of it was never as large as that first major transition I did from not being the published author to being the published one because that transitioning gave me the education I needed to understand the industry enough so that while it continued to change, it was no longer so foreign to me. All right, goody time. You've got a lot of experience. We already had a great section, more or less a masterclass on the monomyth, screenwriting, storytelling, and all kinds of good stuff. Aside from that, Dr. Bo, what kinds of advice do you have for aspiring writers? A lot of people say that they're a writer and they don't do anything, by which I mean they don't actually write. If you are not writing something, you're not actually a writer. Now, it is possible to be doing things that are complementary to writers, and that can be anything. Just by living a lot, just by, just by living a life, you are doing research when it comes to being a writer. If you're getting a bottle of wine, you're researching what your characters might be drinking. Like, you know, if you're reading a book, if you're going to the movies, if you're going for a walk, I highly recommend go for many, many walks, whether you're a long-term writer or if you're just getting started in this. You know, walking, one, you need to do it for your physical strength if you are a writer, because when you're writing, almost always you're going to be seated. You need to compensate that by walking a lot. But um, if you're a first-time writer and if you're just getting started at this, uh, the best advice I can offer you is write something that you would actually enjoy reading. Because if you don't like your book or your article or your story, other people are gonna see through it. They're gonna understand that this author did not enjoy it. And as a result, that may not have been the thing that you should have been authoring. Write your own stories, write your own books. Don't tell other people's books, let them do that. Put your own unique spin on things. Create something that you yourself are proud of and that you yourself would enjoy consuming. We talked about so much and also got to geek out hardcore on Star Wars and so much fun. Loved everything that we discussed here. So Jacobo de la Quercia, thanks so much for sharing your preface with us today. Privilege and a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And there you have it, the conclusion to Jacobo de la Quercia's preface. Really appreciate his time. He was more than generous 
not only with that, but just with his knowledge and understanding of storytelling and the honesty that he brought to the table when discussing his own experience in his preface. I especially value the advice that writers need to be their own personal trainer. I have fitness on my to-do list and fitness can be any number of things, whether that's going for a walk or hitting the gym. I even have a rowing machine in my home just to grind away when I can't always get outside, especially in Arizona where I'm already getting a bit toasty right now. Staying on top of your physical fitness, the way I think about it is essential because a healthy body is a healthy mind. A healthy mind makes for productive and insightful writing. So even if it's just for 15 minutes doing laps around your block, please get out, get some sun at least two to three times a week, bare minimum, and you'll find like just about every writer I've met, that these walks can be essential, not only to coming up with new ideas for your story, but solving plot holes, realizing there are sequencing issues, or maybe there are character arc tweaks you can make to really flesh out your story. So go for walks. And regardless of those stories you write, whether or not they ever get written, I appreciate it Akbo's advice, which is you still gotta do it. This is the job. It's scary. You put years of your life into writing sometimes just a single book and there's absolutely no guarantee it will ever launch in any meaningful sense. It's something I think most writers, myself included, butt heads with, which is the love of the art, the love of the game, but also a very normal human response, which is to want some sort of validation for all your hard work. Thanks again to folks listening literally across the world. Really appreciate it. If you'd like to throw me a shout out, suggestions with authors, or if you'd like to be on the show, at Sam Hale Yeah on Twitter. Sam Hale Yeah at gmail.com as well. If you'd like to check out more about Jacopo, Jacopo de la Quercia.com, and then at Twitter, Jacopo underscore de la underscore Q. Going to be taking a yearly vacation back up to Alaska soon away from keyboard for a little bit, but I will try and get at least one, possibly two more pods out before I jet. But in the meantime, thanks again for checking out the show. Rate and review, it really does make a difference. Share it with friends, authors, doesn't matter. Seems like a lot of people, even if they're not writers, are enjoying the pod, which means a lot to me. So if you're sharing it, if you're enjoying it, I genuinely appreciate it. But until next time, stay humble, folks.